Cheers to next year. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Beecher, CEO of MPTF, the Motion Picture and Television Fund, and welcome to our iconic campus at the Motion Picture Home in Woodland Hills, California. We're delighted that you're able to join us today for this conversation on the COVID-19 vaccine. We're looking forward to uh, getting some great information from our panel of subject matter experts. Before we jump into the panel, though, I'd like to introduce you to our MPTF Director of Volunteer and Community Engagement, Freda Johnson, and the producer of Creative Chaos, Jennifer Clymer. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us. Freda. Hi, Jen. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Um, so we're here just to talk a little bit about the incredible things that we've done since the pandemic started, the way we've pivoted, the way we did not miss a beat. Some of the ways we've done that besides um, addressing social, social isolation and food insecurity is how we have expanded our reach, not just to our residents, but to the community through this great platform of creative chaos. So, uh, yes. <laughs> when the pandemic hit and all of the restrictions came down, um, the term social distancing was something that did not sit well with me or those of us in the creative community. We needed to find a way to socially connect while staying safe and physically distanced. And the creation of Creative Chaos was one of the many ways we were able to do that. This is our 133rd episode. We have hundreds of hours of entertainment, information, and engagement that has been done for and by our residents and volunteer community. We could not be happier about this silver lining in a very, very dark time that has not only allowed us to have donors and volunteers connect, but also some of our favorite celebrities. We're gonna split screen it so we can show you some of their lovely faces right now. While I tell you about um, the technical challenges that we love and have here on Creative Chaos. With a skeleton crew, we've done poetry performances, we've done game shows, we've had interview shows with people like Matt Barnes, we've done um, interactive opportunities with Tom Bergeron, Logan Browning, Jodie Foster hosts her own game show. And it's been a wonderful time for all of our residents to also connect with industry leaders like Greg Berlanti and Jeffrey Katzenberg, Spike Lee, Meg Ryan, Tony Shalhoub, Ron Howard, and Brian Grazer, to name only a few. Um, today is one of those special days where we have taken this platform for information and education, not just entertainment. Although. We do hope you will be entertained by today's panel. So some of the other things that we've done, it's not just celebrity oriented. We have our residents who are producing and creating content for many of these shows. We have volunteers who have stepped up to do instructional videos. Uh, one of our volunteers does a Yiddish class. We have another volunteer who did a gift wrapping class and food instructional videos. We have kids who are coming on, who are playing the piano or doing video greetings for birthday cards. We have two twins, for instance, who have done dances. They're beautiful dancers and they're entertaining our residents that way. Um, one of our volunteers said that they started out sheltering in place, but now they've become artists in residence. And that's really what we like to nurture we like to bring generations together. We like them to support each other and to learn from each other. And it's something that we believe deeply in and Creative Chaos has given us that platform, not only for those kinds of shows, but as Jen said, to bring you important and informative information like we're going to be doing with this vaccine webinar. So thank you very much for joining us. 
Um, this interactive platform is something that we hope to be able to make available to many, many people across the country. Today is one of the first ventures into the, us being able to do that. And for that, we want to introduce you to our Chief Innovation Officer, Dr. Scott Kaiser. I'm sure he's there. Thank you, Scott. Hi, Scott. In the video, of course, but hey, everybody, great to be here. Uh, very excited for today's panel. Uh, just really so, can't emphasize enough the power of what this team's been doing through this creative chaos work and what an invaluable resource this is to have this great source of information, a creative outlet uh, for seniors at MPTF and, and now all across the country. Uh, as you guys have been doing this great work, uh, immunizing our vulnerable uh, seniors against loneliness and boredom and helplessness, today we're here to talk about another uh, immunization uh, vaccine that is top of mind for a lot of people. And we've got some incredible guests here to give us key information. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. I'll start uh, by calling on Joe Palka. So Joe is a science correspondent for NPR. Uh, since joining NPR in 92, he's covered a range of science topics, everything from biomedical research to astronomy. And he's currently uh, working on a series, an eponymous series, Joe's Big Idea, uh, which covers stories that explore the minds and motivations of, science, of scientists and inventors. So I definitely encourage you to check out those stories. And I'll note that, you know, Joe has had his, before radio, he worked in television, he's worked in print, and he comes uh, with a background in science himself. He has a PhD in uh, psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he worked on human sleep physiology. One other thing I'll note, looking through the stories that he's filed over the last year, it's, it's pretty remarkable. His first story on the state of a, of a potential vaccine for the new coronavirus was back on January 29th. So we're all just catching up. He's been following this closely, following every aspect of uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, the race for various treatments, uh, the race for a vaccine, and is here to share information with all of us today. And I know it's near and dear to his heart as a dear loved one of Joe's uh, was a resident on the MPTF campus. Um, so very special connection there. And then I'd like to bring on Dr. Joshua Sharfstein. He is the Vice Dean of Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, he served uh, previously as the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene the principal deputy commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So very relevant that uh, Dr. Sharfstein has had firsthand experience within the FDA. Uh, he's had many other public health leadership positions. Uh, he uh, did his undergrad at Harvard and went on to do medical school at Harvard Medical School and did a residency in pediatric also in Boston at Boston Children's and Boston Medical Center uh, two incredible experts here to make sure that we leave this conversation fully informed so that we can uh, make a decision as to uh, how we're going to proceed as this vaccine finally comes our way. Uh, so really just stepping back for a second, I mean, it's really a remarkable accomplishment of modern science, the, the time frame with which we've brought this vaccine to market. Uh, I'd like to come back to that, but first, let's just talk about there's the basics. Can we please understand what vaccines are available, the different forms, and then probably focus in specifically on how mRNA vaccines work, since our most immediate opportunity is with these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Uh, why don't I start uh, with Joe? Uh, I could go to both of you on this, but let's start with Joe. Got to start somewhere. I think you're muted, Joe. I just wanted to correct you on one thing, Scott. I am not an expert. I am a reporter, <laughs> uh, which I guess makes me an expert reporter. But um, 
uh, Josh is the expert and uh, I am the person who interprets what they say and sometimes clarifies and sometimes muddies the water. But um, I can uh, tell you, I mean, I do know the answer to your question. As you've been hearing this morning, there's two vaccines that now have what the FDA calls or what is known as an emergency use authorization. So because the pandemic has been declared an emergency, the FDA has another mechanism for allowing products to be brought to the public. Usually they have to receive a license, um, but in this case, they can get this thing called an emergency use authorization. And there are some technicalities, I guess, about what you can and cannot do with a, a product that has an emergency use authorization, but it basically means you can get it if it's available. And the first uh, vaccine to uh, get it was Pfizer and a week later, Moderna. I should also say that the kinds of uh, research that was done on these two vaccines closely parallels what they would have had to do to receive a license. It's just that they shortened the time frame and the follow up a little bit so that they could bring it on the market a little sooner, bring it to people a little sooner um, uh, because of the pandemic. Okay, so how do these vaccines work? Well, you mentioned uh, the piece I did in January. That was actually about uh, two weeks after the Chinese scientists reported this genetic sequence of the virus that they, uh, they, they considered caused COVID. And what that allowed people to do was to uh, take out the genetic sequence of the part of the virus that was thought to uh, allow it to enter cells. It's something called the spike protein. Without a functioning spike protein, the virus wouldn't infect you, it would just go into your body and then come out the other end. Um, but the knowledge of the spike protein sequence allowed them to create a vaccine based on that sequence. And what the vaccine does is it, it incorporates actually um, not DNA, but RNA. It's an RNA virus, but never mind. It, it's an RNA which has the genetic information. That genetic information is packaged into a little globule, which we may wind up talking about because the globule is interesting. That globule goes into your body through an injection in the arm. It, in, it actually goes into certain cells in your body. It releases its package of genetic information and the cell then produces this spike protein, this thing that the virus has, but there's no virus, it's just the protein. But the key to it is that by producing that protein, the immune system goes, oh, I see something that looks like a virus. Oh, I should do something. And so it starts doing things. Um, part of the things it does you're not crazy about because it gives you a headache and fever and chills and a sore arm and so on. Not all the time, but some of those things. But That's the key thing it does is that it's your immune system ready. Yeah. And uh, then your immune system figures it out that there's not really a virus there and the initial symptoms just go away. But the memory of the experience is remains, and um, should the virus come along, the, the immune system is prepared to stop it in its tracks, essentially. Hmm. So there is, gosh, how I explain it. Yeah. So Dr. Sharp said, I mean, that's it's remarkable, right? So immunizations, vaccines have been a important tool in the public health toolkit for a long time. Can you put sort of into context, you know, how this new tool fits into the armamentarium uh, oh. and just continue to build upon how this works in this novel way? It's pretty, pretty rare. I think it's helpful maybe just to take a gigantic step back and say, what are vaccines? You know, what, what do vaccines do? And just like Joe was saying, vaccines train the immune system to stop a virus or bacteria from making you sick. And their vaccines can do this in all kinds of different ways. But if you think of like the smallpox vaccine, the vaccine um, stops, uh, you know, trains your immune system. So when you see the smallpox virus, kills it. And enough people were vaccinated that we drove the smallpox virus out of humanity, a virus that had killed hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century alone. Um, there are different kinds of vaccines. There are different ways to train the immune system. But in the end, it's basically teaching the immune system to spot the pathogen, the virus or bacteria, 
and kill it before it kills you. And it's really exciting. When we first knew about this virus, this um, coronavirus, uh, we didn't know whether we could make a vaccine for it. We've never been made a, an effective vaccine for a coronavirus. You think about HIV, they've been trying to make a vaccine for HIV for many years without success. So we didn't know for sure it would even be possible. Now, here we are within the year with multiple vaccines showing efficacy and two of them already cleared to be used in the United States. So it is really good news um, that we can have something to train our immune system to kill the coronavirus before it gives us COVID-19 um, and be very, very effective in doing that. Now, the way that it does it, there are different ways of, that vaccines work. In some cases, you would get a weakened version of the virus or a related virus, that's like smallpox. In other cases, you might get a protein that your body recognizes the protein and then is ready to, to kill the virus or bacteria that comes in with the protein. And actually that technology is being developed for coronavirus. So is the weakened virus version being developed for coronavirus. Pretty much every possible thing is being developed for coronavirus. But the first two that made it through that were really successful were this interesting mRNA technology, which basically um, gives a little bit of genetic code, just like Joe said, for one of the proteins, so it's not any chance, 0% chance that it could get you sick with the virus. And it, your body makes a little bit of the protein and it trains your immune system so that when it sees that protein, which is that, you know, in a lot of those pictures of the virus, it's that red thing sticking out all over the top of the virus. It sees that and it just attacks, both with antibodies, with cells, and it keeps that virus from getting you sick. So that's, that's the idea and it works incredibly well. When they did these studies, with tens of thousands of patients. Half the people got the vaccine, half the people got placebo. Nobody knew whether they got vaccine or placebo. And they looked to see who got sick. Almost everyone got sick, got the placebo. And hardly anyone got sick who got the vaccine. And that's how you know that a vaccine is effective. Yeah, and, and remarkable, I'd like to come back to a, a bunch of those points there in terms of how that particular uh, modality works with the mRNA vaccines, but stepping back again to this amazing time frame with which these have come to market, it's really a remarkable achievement of science. And as you said, everybody's been trying every possible approach. Yeah. Um, this is really something to be celebrated, but it also instills fear. So a common concern is, you know, was the process rushed? Uh, and were corners cut? Uh, I think what's important to keep to in mind, what's important to keep in mind, this wasn't just an amazing accomplishment of science, but it was also an accomplishment of economics. And let me explain why that's the case. We put so much money into these vaccines because this virus was causing such a horrible pandemic that was destroying the, um, the economy. Um, the government was willing to spend billions of dollars on vaccines, even though we didn't know whether they would work. So typically the way a vaccine is made is they do one study, it's called a phase one study. They see whether it works in the phase one study. They wait, the company, and then they say, okay, it worked. Now let's plan the phase two study. And they go one step at a time with some time in between each phase because they don't want to spend money on a phase two study if it's not going to work in phase one. But what the government did here uh, through, um, you know, the uh, Operation Warp Speed in the White House is they said, we're going to pay for every phase at the beginning. We're going to be ready with phase two, um, no matter what happens with phase one. So if the phase one is works, then the next day we can start with the next study. We are ready to go. We've already paid for everyone to get enrolled. Everything's all ready. We're not going to start it until we know that it's safe, but we're going to be ready to go. Now, if that first phase didn't go well, all that would have been wasted effort and wasted money, but we were willing to spend that money because of the urgency. Similarly, we weren't going to start, um, you know, typically you would wait to plan a huge study. They plan the huge study right from the beginning. And even more importantly, an ordinary vaccine, you would never try to manufacture millions and millions of doses before you knew that it worked. Here, we started manufacturing millions and millions of doses because the taxpayers were paying for it. And if the study showed that it didn't work, they would have just tossed it into the Atlantic Ocean. There's nothing you could do. But what they didn't want to have happen is it worked, and now we got to start planning to make it and then have another year go by, which might typically happen. Right now, we paid from the beginning to start that manufacturing. 
so the, the, the companies were racing to do the manufacturing before the studies were done just so that they could be ready in case the studies work. So it is both a miracle of science or maybe miracle might be a little bit, it's a, a triumph of science that we have this technology which builds on years of research, years of investment, good understanding of the previous SARS virus and other things. It builds on all that, but it was also the economics of we're gonna be ready to do things right after each other. And so to a large extent, the reason this went so fast wasn't because the studies were smaller, because actually they did 50,000 patients in one of the studies. I mean, they're really huge vaccine trials, but because each section just started right after the next one, just immediately with no pause in between. Yeah, so when you, when you raise that, you know, that it is an economic triumph and it's amazing how many resources, but that also can raise suspicion as well and, you know, conjure images of backroom dealings and greedy pharmaceutical companies, you know, trying to just get get out something fast to, to profit. Uh, Joe, you've been involved, I mean, the, this has all been very transparent though. I know you've sat through eight hour long FDA committee meetings and whatnot. Which, what do you look like you have something you want to add? Anyway. Well, yeah, I was thinking about this question about uh, cutting corners and, and the, the analogy that came to my mind, it's not perfect, but I think it really is one that people can resonate with. It's like doing a kitchen renovation, right? Normally you think, well, it's a certain amount of time, but it takes forever. Why? Because you have to order the countertop and you have to wait for the plumber to get free and you have to have the inspection and you have to, you know, et cetera. It's possible to do the renovation in a few days if everybody who's needed is ready and all the equipment is there and the parts have been ordered and uh, distrib you know everything lines up. And so in a way, that was where the corner it wasn't cutting corners, it was expediting the, the flow so that things could happen as soon as they were able instead of waiting around for the inspector to show up and do the next level. Now, transparency is a it, 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 is a funny thing. Um, I would like I have a lot of questions. I would like to ask somebody. I would like to ask the FDA a lot of questions about their thinking. I'd like to ask Pfizer a lot of questions about its thinking. I'd like to talk to Moderna about things that they've thought about. And, and but it's it's hard. You cannot reach these people. So. When there is a public event like these eight hour uh, uh, advisory committee meetings, yes, a lot of stuff is out in the open, but there's still, for me at least, uh, there's some things that you have to take on faith. And, and I, I can understand, I mean, you know, pharmaceutical companies, although have, they are known to have good intentions, some, you know, in, in, in some level, they're not pure as the driven snow. And so there's always a question of, well, you know, Pfizer decided to do its vaccine development without federal money. They said, we're all, we've got a guaranteed purchaser. So they weren't taking a huge risk, but they said, we're going to do all our development on our own, which means they can set the price and they can determine what things they want to do with it. And there's less scrutiny, frankly, than there would be um, with the Moderna vaccine, which was a joint development project between the NIH or the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, who Tony Fauci would hasten to say that I should mention. Um, uh, you know, so it, it's a little more uh, transparent. But I don't get the sense, I really don't, that, that there's any, I mean, I don't, I think there's money to be made here, but I don't think that's the driving force in what these companies are up to. There's too much uh, of an emergency on our hands and too much goodwill if they succeed that you know money won't be able to buy the goodwill that Pfizer will have earned if it uh, helps stop this uh, pandemic. Well, I, I think it's important to think about the role that FDA has played here. The FDA is a public agency and I've worked there. there over 10,000 people at the agency, many of them scientists with advanced degrees who are really devoted to using science to protect the health of the country, their own families, their own communities, and then everyone. Um, and in this case, it was pretty interesting. You know, there was a lot of pressure on FDA to cut corners. I mean, I think we should be honest. That's why the president was 
issuing a whole bunch of tweets saying, approve it already, approve it already. And the agency didn't do that. What the FDA did was they put out a standard that explained itself, that really explained the agency's thinking, here's the data we need to feel comfortable that a vaccine is safe and effective enough. And in that document, they said they needed the same number of patients as they would have for any vaccine study. So that's how you got these studies of 50,000 patients. So this wasn't like some tiny little study like Russia might have done. You know, they didn't base it just on the antibodies that people get. They said, we want to actually see that a vaccine is preventing disease. That was a policy set by the FDA. And then they said, we wanted to see at least a 50% decline. Anything less than that in illness, we won't count. We won't, we, we will not, we will not authorize the vaccine for anything less than that. And then they said, we want to see at least two months on uh, median safety data because we would expect to see side effects in that those first two months. And that got a lot of pushback. If you go back to some of the papers, the White House was saying they didn't agree with that. FDA insisted. The scientists said, we're under the law. We have the authority to decide whether a vaccine is safe and effective, and we're going to use it. We are insisting on these standards. And the FDA insisted on that, and they insisted on a public advisory committee meeting, which no other country did, to really review the data. So you had FDA scientists setting the standards, FDA scientists reviewing the raw data. It was one of the, uh, I think we're the only regulatory agency or one of the only ones that doesn't just look at the summary provided by the drug companies of what the study showed. They look at every piece of data and do their own analysis. And I've seen that up front. I met the people who do that. They are completely devoted to getting that right. And then they put together these dense 50 page memos with everything that they found they release them publicly. They bring in independent people to ask whatever questions they have for an entire day. You have, even with a lot of external pressure, the FDA went through its usual process. And I think for that reason, people should feel confident that they're getting the guidance and you know a stamp of approval from really the best people who are trained to look at something like this in this country who's only you know, purpose is to serve the public interest. And I think the FDA, under a lot of pressure, managed to deliver in this case. Yeah, and I, I think we owe a debt of gratitude. I mean, those pe people at the FDA who worked 24-7 through Thanksgiving, reviewing every document, reams and reams of, of data. Back to this kind of skepticism around pharmacy, big pharma, though. Um, Dr. Sharfstein, I mean, you have been vocal in the past uh, critical of some pharmaceutical marketing uh, uh, tactics. So I, I would, I just say that to state that clearly you're somebody who's not afraid to be very honest and transparent about concerns about profit motive and pharma. So uh, with that perspective, again, can you just speak to your feeling about any concerns people have about the safety of this vaccine? Sure. I, for the safety of the vaccine, for the analysis, I rely on the FDA. You know, I think companies do great work, and it, they did fantastic work in this case. So many scientists inside the companies to do the studies, but I wouldn't rely on the companies alone. I rely on the companies to do their work and the FDA to, to review all their data, to reanalyze all the data. You know, there's they, these are profit-driven companies. You know, every medicine we take is taken it, and with only a very few exceptions is uh, manufactured by a profit-driven company. We have a system in this country where we regulate profit-driven companies so that we have safe and effective medicines. And by and large, that works extremely well. And so um, the fact that they're interested in profits does not in any way um, change my opinion that we have products that have been very thoroughly reviewed by people whose focus is on the public interest and that they've done a good job setting the standards for those companies to have to meet. And to the credit of the companies, the companies embraced the standards, even when they were being pushed to, to call for lower standards, the companies didn't do that. Um, and I think they realized, uh, and I'll tell you, it's interesting. I think by and large, the pharmaceutical companies respect the FDA because they know that people just wouldn't rely entirely on the companies. You really need an independent agency with qualified scientists looking at the data, really pushing them to for, for people to feel confident. And, and that's the basis. In this country, we have not just the companies. 
We have an independent review of the data. We have an independent advisory committee meeting. We have a lot of transparency about what that analysis showed. And to me, that that I'm rolling up my sleeve when my time comes based on that. And and let's speak, let's look at to the data that they had to examine here. I mean, as you guys mentioned, you know, the bar was set at 50% would be a fat, a passing grade. And it's, it's amazing that we're looking at, you know, high nineties of potential efficacy on these trials, but I don't think everybody understands what that means. How did these trials work, right? I mean, how do you know that it's effective or, or how do you judge efficacy? Uh, Joe, perhaps you could break that down for us in just real simple bite-sized pieces. Sure. Well, um, you, you take a pool of people that you hope is representative of all people or most people, and then you randomly assign, and this is the key thing, you randomly assign them to get either the vaccine or this inert placebo, nothing, nothing in the syringe that could have an effect. And the reason that's important is you assume that it, to start out with, the two groups are equivalent. I mean, they're not all the exact same people, obviously. They're not 100% one man here, one man there. But if you get enough people and you randomly assign them to one group or another, the assumption is, well, you've got two equal groups. And then time goes forward. And the only thing different in those two groups is the vaccine. They behave the same way. They have the same level of, of underlying health conditions. They have the same number of uh, overweight and, and age and what have you. Same number of people in each group. The only difference between the two groups is one got a vaccine, the other didn't. Well, as time goes forward, people get infected with the virus. It's one of the paradoxes that you can, the only way you can test the, a vaccine works is if you test it where there is a virus or a, the, pro, the thing that you're trying to protect people from. And so in a way, one of the triumphs of the Trump administration was to make sure there were enough infected people for the vaccines to be able to be tested rapidly in this country. It's a little cynical, but we won't talk about that. But what it means is it, while the trial is going on, nobody has any knowledge whether the people who are getting infected got the vaccine or didn't get the vaccine. But at some point, they do what's called unblinding. They have a committee that that does have the key to say who got what. And in this case, they waited until a certain number of people, it turned out to be, well, it doesn't matter. In the end, it turned out to be about 190 or 200 people. When 200 people got sick, they looked to see whether those people had been vaccinated or not vaccinated. Same group, the only difference vaccine. And what they found, as Josh said, was 90% or 95% of those people were in the group that didn't get vaccinated, and only 5% were in the group that did get vaccinated. So the conclusion is, since they're equivalent in all their other behaviors that we know about, vaccine must explain the difference. That's the logic of the trial. No, I think well, how do you know they got infected? You right. don't know individually whether a particular person, what they did or how they did it. All you know is that the same things that are going to happen in one group are going to happen in the other group approximately to the same number. So because you can't ethically just infect people with the virus, that would not work. You right. have to follow a big enough group over time and then see if there's a big enough difference beyond chance. Right. Um, and there are people, there are, there are discussions about infecting people. And as some have argued that this is an occasion where that would be useful. I have to think that I've talked to a lot of people who've thought about this and written about this and considered this. And while some people favor it, the majority at this point say it's not necessary and unethical because there's no treatment for COVID-19. I mean, there are some people that are exposed deliberately to um, malaria, for example, but there's good drugs for treating malaria. So, but. Yeah. You don't need to go into that. That's, so, that's a yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind from these studies what we know and what we don't know. So on effectiveness, just like Joe said, we know these are very effective vaccines, at least for the first few months. We don't know how long immunity lasts, though. And so that'll be something that additional research will have to tell us. 
Now, somebody might say, well, why don't you wait to find that out before you start vaccinating? Well, then you're losing the opportunity to protect people for a whole bunch of months. And people who are experts in this think that protection is probably going to last a year or longer, which, of course, is really important in the setting of a massive pandemic that is killing so many people. So, um, so we do know that it works. We don't know how long it'll work. But um, it'll probably be for a reasonable period of time, and then it might be possible to get booster shots. So we're going to learn more. But um, it's impossible to know everything right at the beginning if you're trying to save lives in the middle of a pandemic. Now, what about safety? We have studied now in tens of thousands of patients, some of them very intensely, where they're getting questionnaires about exactly how they're feeling. And um, the safety data really uh, shows um, a lot of kind of modest side effects like Joe was talking about, like the arm hurting, maybe getting a, a bit of a fever or sore joints for a day and then feeling better. And just like you said, Scott, that's really kind of the sign that the vaccine is working, that the immune system is kicking in. Um, there really uh, there, uh, weren't signs in these studies of major side effects that were happening in the group that got the vaccine that would come anywhere close to um, balancing against the benefit. So for that reason, it was very easy for the advisors to the FDA to say that the benefits far exceed the risks, which I think they, they basically did. Now, that's what we know. We're still gonna learn more though. We're gonna learn more about different specific side effects, like the rare risk of an allergic reaction. We might know more exactly who's at greatest risk for that, um, that those reactions are treatable, but we wanna minimize them. We're also going to learn if there are rare side effects that you don't see in a trial of tens of thousands of people, but you might see when millions of people get immunized. So if you have a, a, an adverse event that might happen one in a million cases, you wouldn't see it in the trial, but you might see it. So some people might say, well, why don't we wait? Why don't we wait? You know, I'm going to wait until millions of people get it before I decide, because I want to know every possible rare side effect. The problem there is while you're waiting, you may be susceptible to COVID. And so um, the idea that the vast majority of side effects, the side effects that might balance up against the benefit, they do know from the trial, that's the thinking. You know, that's the reason that it's okay to go forward with vaccination. And that's why people should very seriously consider being vaccinated when it's offered to you. I'll tell you my, uh, a good friend of mine who is in his mid seventies, with diabetes, but is responsible for two kids under the age of 10, had a chance to be vaccinated. And he said, maybe I want to wait to see all the rare side effects. And I was like, you are at such high risk, especially given your job of getting COVID and not, you know, maybe you could die from COVID, particularly with diabetes. But even if you survive, there are long-term effects from COVID people get. So if you're waiting to see, you know, the one in a million or one in 10 million adverse effects from the vaccine, you're living at extraordinarily high risk and your kids really need you, you know? And, and he said, um, I will get vaccinated and he got vaccinated. But I think you have to put this in context of what we're up against. We're up against a ferocious virus that is claiming so many lives. None of us know whether we'll have an easy case or a hard case, whether we'll be stuck with lingering symptoms, whether we'll be struggling for air for weeks on end. And so to have a vaccine right now with extraordinarily high effectiveness and a very strong safety record from these studies, it's true we don't know everything, but we know a lot. And that was the reason that the, these independent advisory committees said to proceed. I think that's very helpful, breaking it down into what we know from the science so far, what we still don't know and we'll need time. But again, putting it into the overall context of comparing this, nothing is risk-free, but we're comparing the risk of this vaccine to the known risk of, uh, of getting infected with the coronavirus, which could obviously have immediate and long-term implications. In terms of these particular mRNA vaccines, I mean, we didn't get into the details. And I don't think we have time. It's really fascinating how these little fat droplets become the vehicle uh, by which they're delivered to the mRNAs delivered to where it needs to go. But is it correct to say that most of the side effects are not necessarily side effects from the mRNA, but more either components of the vaccine or just, again, your immune system responding? 
I think it's most likely the immune system responding. I mean, because basically um, the mRNA gets into the cells. The mRNA sort of degrades very quickly. It's been compared to a Snapchat message. I don't know whether everybody here is familiar with Snapchat. I'm not nearly as familiar as my kids are. But these are like email messages that disappear. It's kind of like that. It just gets in the cell. It makes a little bit of protein. The protein gets shown to the immune system. And the immune system, just like Joe said, just goes like, whoa, that looks like something I've got to prepare for and starts communicating with itself, the immune system really revs up. That immune system revving up is what gives you a fever. That's why we get fevers when we get sick, is our immune system revving up. So it's really engaging the immune system, but it's engaging the immune system with just this one little piece of the virus so that the immune system is ready when we see the whole virus. But what assures you that those little genetic instructions can't go and instruct some other process or or as you said, you, they, they just disappear like Snapchat messages. So yeah. you don't think that they can impact other uh, genetic processes? Well, you know, it's a kind of, um, it's a particular kind of RNA that really degrades quickly, doesn't get around too far. It, it, it can only make one protein, which is the spike protein of the virus. That's what it's programmed to do. There's, it can't change its program. So. You know, and, and it has uh, quite a long um, record that's been, you know, studied for I think a decade or more, without any any real concerns. And there's no really biological plausibility to some of the crazy things you might read on the internet happening. You know, so I mean, again, you know, there you can't prove a negative. You know, um, but for everything everyone knows, all of the science about this is that this is a pretty ingenious way of giving a temporary instruction to the immune system. And it does it in a way that is, in some respects, a lot simpler than other vaccines. So if you go back to like the smallpox vaccine or a bunch of other vaccines, they're actually made in cells. They're made in cells. Well, there was a point for a diarrhea vaccine where it turned out those cells were infected with another virus. And the other virus was getting into the vaccine. So people were getting a lot of the other virus. Fortunately, that virus turned out to be harmless, but it was a little bit of a, you know, of a pause for everybody to take a look at what was going on. When you're making something in a cell, you know, you're dealing with a biological system which has a lot of complicating factors. And there are plenty of ways to try to assess the safety of that. But this is not made in a cell. These mRNA vaccines are just manufactured. It's very simple. What, what's done. So it has a lot less stuff in there than a lot of other vaccines. And it has a very clear path to do this protein and, and, um, and, you know, instruct the immune system. And, you know, I think it's a combination of understanding the science, the history of these vaccines, and the massive clinical trials that have been done with just a lot of scrutiny that give people confidence about it right now. And again, you know, if nobody had ever heard of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 and someone said, do you want to try to take this vaccine? You'd say, why would I accept any risk if there's no disease out there? You know, there was a time where we kind of did that with, with uh, against an influenza that really wasn't causing disease. Um, and so then, you know, the risks might even if they're infinitesimally small, outweigh the benefits if they're zero. In this case, the benefits of not getting COVID are massive. And so that, that I think, is what is, you know, giving people confidence that this is a reasonable thing to do at this point in time because you have tremendous benefits and all the evidence on risk pointing it to be um, reasonably minimal. Joe? Well, I, I was just going to say I, I agree with everything Josh said. The, the, the trouble is from a communication standpoint, um, there are theoretical, hypothetical things that you might discuss in a graduate seminar on immunology or virology that people would kick around and say, well, this could happen or that could happen. They are the subject of things that, that experts don't agree on and have no certainty about, but, it, but, they're, but they're very arcane and suddenly they're being discussed in the media sometimes. And it's not a discussion that either A, most of the reporters are capable of boiling down, or B, the public is capable of putting into balance. The people who really understand the issues in some of these line one insertion elements are, you know, the 12 people in the country who've studied it extensively. And, you know, they're not throwing up the 
warning flags and saying stop everything. So that makes me confident that there's no reason to do that. But people who don't know some of these things are, oh my goodness, there's a risk. It, it's it's a, and, it, and it's the internet that has made these things available to all people almost all the time, uh, right away. Uh, there's another thing that's happened, and, and this is just the way science works, only it, it never worked quite this fast, is it used to be you wrote a paper, you sent it to a journal. The journal looked at it and decided whether it was valuable or had brought something new or was done properly, and then it either published it or didn't. You never heard about the ones that didn't publish, or most of the time you didn't. But now everything that's proposed by anyone, anywhere, at, for any reason, when they have an idea, they put it up on uh, a server. Anybody can look at it. It's a great idea intellectually, academically. It lets the community judge the value of a particular paper. But people can focus on something that they don't really understand, misinterpret it, and think there's a danger when there really isn't. Right. And unfortunately, we know social media and the internet are, are better, are well tuned to spreading in, incorrect information, uh, uh, untruth. Um, so, but we have many people joining us across multiple platforms today and the questions are rolling in. So let's give them some qualified, uh, good factual information here. Let's go rapid fire for a little bit so that we do have time to get to all of these questions and just go through some of the common questions going through. Um, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, very similar. A lot of the differences are around packaging, storage, you know, uh, Sir, supply, delivery, logistics, fundamental differences. How would I choose? Is there anything that would make me, you know, be more inclined to get one over the other? I don't think at this point there's a basis. Yeah. Whichever one you can get your hands on. Whichever one you can get. I love it. And you don't be shy. Keep going rapid fire here. Can you mix the two vaccines? What if you, what what if you you get your hands on one and then you end up getting a second? What what happens then? Um, that's not ideal. It's better to get the same vaccine twice because that's how it was studied. Yeah. So the and the, the vaccine when you get a first dose, the second dose is allocated for you, uh, and it's very important that you you have your booster of the same. So definitely a not ideal to to mix the two. Um, does the first shot do anything, or does all the power come with the second shot? Looks like there's a um, benefit to uh, getting sick after a couple weeks from the first shot. It's not known how powerful that is and how long it lasts though, because everyone in the study has pretty much got the second shot. So right now it's definitely recommended that people follow what happened in the studies for two shots. Should someone with an autoimmune disease be concerned about getting the vaccine? Um, I don't think there's a basis for being concerned at the moment. You may wanna talk it over with your doctor you know, it's not a live virus. There's certain um, uh, viruses that are not recommended for people with certain types of immune system issues, but um, I don't think that's an issue uh, for this virus at this point. Um, but uh, it's possible that more information will come out as it's studied further. Joe, perhaps add to that with there's been a lot of back and forth about pregnant women, breastfeeding, uh, you know, when we'll know for kids and things like that. Well, um, it's again, it's an ethical question. I mean, people are routinely screened from studies if they are pregnant or breastfeeding, but it also works out that people wind up getting pregnant over the course of a study, even though they didn't know they were going to. So there's a little data, and so far there's no clear signal that it's bad. And the children, yeah, it's a conundrum. Again, um, you don't want to do anything that would harm them, um, and it's a little unclear that the virus is as dangerous to younger children as it is to older adults. But um, from a societal standpoint, you don't want them being running around and spreading the virus. So um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a decision. But they're starting studies down to 12 years old. That's what I've understood today. So right. I would just emphasize that point that the data is not available yet for children. Right. Right. So it's too soon. And and if I've already been infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, what do I need to get the vaccine then? The recommendation is yes now. Um, it's it's not known how often or how likely you are to be reinfected. It's probably not as likely, but it's 
apparently not impossible and the vaccine should help prevent that. Yeah, there were a number of people in the study who had evidence of having been infected before and then got SARS got COVID during the study. So um, for that reason, that it's it's recommended. So th I think this gets into the uh, highlights some of the what we know and what we don't know. But do we need to wear a mask after we get the vaccine, and, and why? So um, one of the things that we don't know is whether or not the vaccine keeps us from getting infected and passing it on, but not getting sick. So we, we do know that the vaccine really keeps us from getting sick. It's a dramatic reduction in illness. That's that 95%. But could we still get infected, not know it, and pass it on to someone else? We don't know that for sure. There will be studies that are going to come out that tell us probably it reduces it. How much does it reduce? the chance of passing it on, we don't know. So for that reason, particularly right now, people should still wear a mask. Even if they can't themselves get sick, it would prevent them from passing it to someone else if it turns out they were to get sick. For that reason, that, that it's still recommended. Now, the other thing to mention here is that these types of precautions are particularly appropriate when there's a lot of virus spreading in the community like there is in many parts of the country, including LA, particularly LA. So when that's the case, people need to take a ton of extra precautions gradually over time as more people get vaccinated and we see the number of people in the community going down, 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 down. Some of these recommendations will start to shift. Yeah. Okay. A couple of great questions coming in that it's almost unfair to ask in a rapid fire fashion, uh, but really want to hear from both of you on these. What do you say, Chandra Jackson has asked, what do you say to people of color who are wary of vaccines based on uh, U.S. history, uh, smallpox, syphilis, forced sterilization, et cetera. And that's just in scientific testing, let alone greater uh, distrust, reason for distrust. I think you say understand that there is that history and that that may be a reason why people distrust the vaccine. And I think um, it's important to really take time to answer people's questions that they have about the vaccine and to work with community leaders so that they get their questions answered and that they can turn around and explain the basis of their uh, confidence in the vaccine. And I think um, this is not something that you would expect people to necessarily automatically just jump and say, well, I want to be the first in line. But at the same time, you hope that people are really looking around, realizing, in fact, that this technology was developed by um, African-American scientists in part, that there are people who at, at every stage of um, the distribution system and public health system are from every background, but many um, African-American leaders in public health and medicine are supportive. And to really try to understand why that's the case and hope that you, know, you can explain it well enough and people feel confident to ask the questions that they have and eventually um, people will uh, will hear about it. Um, I also think it's important to work with um, physicians in, in communities that are particularly at risk and maybe um, have this uh, history of legacy of distrust because people often seek out and trust physicians within uh, all across, for example, my own city of Baltimore. And doctors should be able to answer their patients' questions, recommend the vaccine if they think that, you know, that they understand it. And if you can do that, you can work through um, trusted organizations. And one, one last point, which I think is particularly important, the vaccine has to be accessible to people. And you can't say, well, just because some people are distrusting the vaccine, then that must be the reason that they don't want it. It may, it's a combination, I think, of trust and access. So if you imagine a senior housing development somewhere, in, um, say, take in a city, and you're telling people there, well, you've got to leave your apartment in the middle of a pandemic. You've got to go, you know, two buses down to some place that, you know, there's some clinic set up where you're not going to be treated very well. Then, you know, you understand why people are like, I'm not doing that. On the other hand, if you show up with a trusted community organization to that senior housing community, um, you have community leaders there, you have the physicians there, and you go door to door and you offer the vaccine. Well, that, that may be different. People may say like the way that a vaccine is being made available to me inspires trust. And so we have to think about access and, and acceptance as two sides of the same coin. So as building upon that, now that 
everybody's informed. I think we're all going to be clamoring to get the vaccine, realizing that it is uh, far better, uh, you know, risk profile than the alternative of going unvaccinated. Can can either of you speak to the thought behind tiering, or uh, you know, how do you actually go about making these tough decisions? How are leaders making these tough decisions? about the prioritization of the distribution of the vaccine so that that can be done in an equitable and sensible way. Well, again, you have another committee, this one called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that has been recommending things to CDC. So that's an open um, uh, advisory process. If, If there were a for sure right answer um, it would be much easier, but there are trade-offs, um, and people have to m- make certain judgments. And I don't. I mean, I just. I with a limited supply, it's it's going to be uncomfortable for a while while access, you know, is is chosen who gets it and who doesn't. What's what's odd is that in some cases, you know, people are anxious to get it, and some people people are apprehensive about getting it. Or, or eager and apprehensive, I guess, is the words I want. But um, yeah, it's not it's not straightforward, or it would it wouldn't be an issue. And for this particular audience, it's interesting. There's been some discussion of the value of having uh, some celebrities uh, immunize, whether to do that or not. Again, to help build trust. Uh, but you know, we we on the other hand, forgetting the celebrity side, this is an industry where people are working in close quarters and uh, are in some risky situations. Uh, Any thoughts in terms of uh, prioritization of access to the vaccine for people working in this industry? I think it's important to realize that these prioritization discussions are really for just a period of weeks to a couple months. I mean, I think more and more vaccines should become available. So this is not hopefully a very extended period of prioritization. Um, I think that the um, committee did the best job that it could looking for high, uh, people at high risk for serious illness. Um, and they went in part with age for the next phase and in part with frontline essential employees. And I think that uh, you'll start to see within, and it, a lot of it happens at the state level, that th- these types of employees may be defined differently in different states uh, based on uh, the regional economy. but. Um, uh, at least initially, the, the type of employees they're talking about are like grocery store workers, people who are really doing the essential things for all the rest of us to, to get by and who have really borne a disproportionate share of the illnesses. And then I think it will gradually become more available and, and there'll be a lot of decisions made at the state level. And then eventually, there'll be enough vaccine that everybody um, who is ready for vaccination will be able to get it. So with just a minute remaining here, Uh, I just want to summarize some of the key points that uh, there is a lot we know this has been, these vaccines have been studied in large groups. There's a lot we know in terms of the safety and the FDA had to make a decision uh, to determine that the safety uh, of this vaccine and the potential efficacy, the efficacy outweighed uh, any potential risks of not going ahead with the vaccine, but there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know about how long immunity will last. We don't know about uh, potential transmissibility for people who, you know, have had the vaccine. Can they still get others infected because be asymptomatic carriers, so to speak? Um, So I can't thank you both enough for taking. I think we're going to have to extend this into another hour, but just any uh, brief closing thoughts as we wrap up here. I would just say I think it's great that people are asking questions when you're thinking about it, and it's good to, you know, feel confident um, to ask questions and get those answered, and then make a good decision for yourself. But like my friend who I was just talking to, you know, the risks of COVID are real. Any decision about vaccination has to be put into that framework. This is not vaccine versus everything's going to be perfectly fine. This is vaccine versus you could get COVID. You get very sick with COVID. You could have long-term effects with COVID, and 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 that's the situation that that we're in, not just individually, but as a as a community. And we know that the effects of COVID on our country, on our cities, our counties, have just been profound. So uh, hopefully that will um, 
you know, lead people to, um, you know, really seek out good information and make good choices for themselves. Joe, you know, one big idea to bring it home? Well, um, yeah, I guess I would, I, I completely agree that people should ask questions. And we've talked a little bit about this. I think that the main thing they should do is be careful where they get the answers from. So I think there are lots of good trusted sources out there. I mean, Certainly, Johns Hopkins was among the first to be publishing data about this, Mayo Clinic, um, Harvard, Brown. There's a lot of universities. I think that the NIH has a has a pretty uh, good track record with clear information in the CDC. It's where you start getting into um, uh, less well-known and less respected places that you can get some information that might steer you in the wrong direction. And so just be careful who's telling you and how they know what they're saying before you jump into some decision that could be important one way or the other. We do have a lot of great information at coronavirus.jhu.edu, and I host a podcast, a public health on call podcast, where we have a lot of experts coming in to talk about the vaccine and other issues. Joe Palka, Joshua Sharfstein, thank you so much for joining us today on MPTF's Creative Chaos. A real pleasure. Uh, to all of you who participated, thank you so much for all the great questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I think you've given us reason to uh, go for a sequel. Hollywood loves a sequel. And I know I'm pushing into Hawk Koch, Koch's time with Inside Hollywood, uh, so I won't keep you longer. But just one parting thought, please visit mptf.com where you can uh, review this uh, recording of this pro uh, presentation. You can get access to all sorts of great information, uh, links to great videos on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, mptf.com. And just really glad that we could use this creative chaos platform uh, to inform our community and hopefully be a great source of information for seniors everywhere. Uh, and let's just, let's keep up the good work and fight this good fight together. Thank you all. Thank you so much. That was a great panel. Hopefully we can uh, bring them back. There are so many questions that still have not been answered. We will be back in just a moment with Inside Hollywood with